All right, guys. Um, today we're going to talk about the book of Judges and show a thumbs, thumbs up. Did all the reading, thumbs down. Did none of the reading. Even yesterday's Christmas reading. Woo. Yes. That was. Yes. The Christmas reading was very intense Christmas reading if you did it on Christmas Day. I did not. I did it on Friday. I was like, I'm going to get this out of the way. Christmas, I'm just going to drive and eat cinnamon rolls and open presents. So the book of Judges is really unique. Uh, I think a lot of times people are like, what do we do with this book? Besides like it being very entertaining stories, these are thrilling adventures. I don't know why this hasn't been turned into an HBO series yet. Um, Because it would make so much money. There's been a few movies about uh, some of the judges. Like, there's been a few Samson movies, I think. But they kind of water it down. And they try to turn Samson into this just, like, shiny hero. And then the movie sucks and it flops. And, like, you wonder why. But uh, Game of Thrones was super successful on HBO. Judges would be even more successful. Um, So, hopefully, no one's watched Game of Thrones. That's a test. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Okay. Let me pray for us. And then we'll just start talking about it. And hopefully you guys have questions today too. Uh, Father, thanks for this morning and thank you for the snow. God, thank you that even in your creation, we have we have pictures and images of, of the work that you've accomplished for us through Christ. Uh, God, your word says that you have made our sin that is crimson white as snow. So even this morning, it's a reminder of how you have washed us and cleansed us with the precious blood of Christ. And we're forgiven in Christ And when we come to him in faith and turn from our sin. So God, this morning, um, as we sit in this room together and and as a a lot of our brothers and sisters uh, watch this later in the week, God, we ask that you would instruct us, that you would reveal yourself to us through your word, that you would make our our minds hurt with how big and wise you are. Um, But God, also that you would comfort us and, and help us know and understand who you are more clearly and more fully. We love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, some preliminary stuff for the book of Judges. Let me get my drawings out. Turn that one off. I put this up last week. This is how the Old Testament is organized in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, How Jesus read his Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. It would have been in this order. However, uh, order is kind of misleading because right now all of you have a Bible that it has a binding. So no matter what, the next book in your Bible after Judges is Ruth. There's no changing that. But for Jesus and all the people who were before him, all of these were individual scrolls. So the book of Genesis was an individual scroll. The book of Exodus was an individual scroll. Eventually the Torah gets put onto this huge scroll that gets, uh, it literally gets stoned together so that you can scroll through the Torah scroll. But each one of these as well, Joshua, that's its own scroll. Judges, its own scroll. Isaiah, um, these 12 minor prophets that we will read later in the year, they all sit on one scroll. It's called the book of the 12 or the, the scroll of the 12. And even those minor prophets they're not organized in chronological order. They're organized in thematic order. So what they'll end up doing is they'll map onto this thematic sequence that the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel has. And then the same thing in the writings, the Ketuvim. The Psalms is its own scroll. The book of Job, its own scroll. Uh, Ruth, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, Esther, those were kept on a single scroll. Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, Chronicles. Those are all separate scrolls. So all of these scrolls um, exist and the the books that follow each other, that ordering exists in the mind. You guys have it existing uh, bound for you, but this ordering exists in the mind. So it's a collection of scrolls that all follow each other. Right now we're in this section of the Old Testament. We call these books the historic books. Uh, And I'd be willing to bet even if you turned to your table of contents, it might even organize them that way to where it says either um, the law or the Pentateuch, and then it says the historic books, and then it divides it into um, either wisdom or poetic books, and then you have the prophetic books. So that's the way our Bibles tend to organize these. Um, But I just think it's helpful to, to know that 
at least Jesus and those who preceded him would have thought of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings as prophetic books. They are called the former prophets because these four books function together to tell one story. What happened? What's like the main thing that happens in the book of Joshua? They cross the Jordan, they go into the land, and they take possession of the land. What happens at the very end of 2 Kings? We haven't gotten there yet. So this is like, are you a Bible nerd, Bendy, now? They're like, they're completely exiled from the land. So right there, you have entering into the land, getting kicked out of the land. That is what this narrative is about. Joshua judges 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. It's about God bringing this people into the land. And then through their sin, through their rebellion, and through their ongoing corruption, they're exiled from the land. And the way these books function is as a prophetic witness, or as if the prophets are saying, here is our evidence for why God is just in exiling the people from the land. So just like in a courtroom, someone's standing up and saying, this person is guilty. So the prophets are standing up and they're saying, Israel is guilty. And here is why. And after reading Judges, you kind of get a sense, oh yeah, Israel is kind of guilty of a lot of things. So the point of a lot of these stories is to paint Israel in a bad light because the prophets are showing in this, these writings, they're showing why God was just and righteous to exile his people from the land. So that's like very macro how all these things are fitting together. Any questions on that? I remember that like blow, this stuff blowing my mind the first time I heard it. I was like, hold on a second. There's different ways to think about these orders and what these books are doing. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. So our reading plan that we're doing, it's not taking you straight through your Bible um, because that would get very tedious and boring right away because you'll then you would read first and second Kings, then first and second Chronicles, and then everyone gives up. So we're not doing that. Um, but we're also not doing this reading plan either. We're not reading in this order. What we're doing is it's kind of um, a morph of this, what we have in our Bible and a chronological order. So what we're reading right now uh, is um, the story before the kingdom, and then we're going to read the establishment of the kingdom. Then we'll read the books and the prophets that take place before exile. Then we'll read the books and the prophets that take place during exile. And then we'll read the books and the prophets that take place after exile. So we're kind of doing more of a chronological sequence, but we're kind of meshing these two ways of reading it. And then when we get to the New Testament, we just read it straight through with the exception of, I think we read Luke after John. That way we read, we read Luke and Acts together because they're written by the same author and they're, it's like volume one, volume two. So those are kind of the differences. So yeah, um, don't just assume the next page is the reading plan. Make sure you check either your app or your bookmark. Continue. Okay. So that's, yeah. Um, by Today, we read the whole book of Ruth. Yep, and we just finished Judges yesterday. Yep. Okay, now let me talk about the macro view of Judges. This is what I made last night. Um, I basically just stole the outline of, of how Bible Product does it. I just put these going long ways instead of up and down, and I don't have cool pictures in it. Um, but... The entire book of Judges is framed by a few sayings. In the first half of the book, you hear over and over again that the Israelites were doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the word for sight is the Hebrew word for eyes. So over and over again, the people do what is evil in the eyes of the Lord. People do what is evil in the eyes of the Lord. And when you get towards the end of the book, chapters 17 through 21, it has a repeated phrase over and over again that in those days, the people of Israel did what was right in their own eyes. They did what was right in their own eyes. So this entire book is framed by these sayings uh, and, and they're saying the same exact thing. It's just two ways of saying it. One says the people of Israel did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, but 
people of Israel were doing what was right in their own eyes. So this is a tension between what is right and what is wrong and about the corruption of the Israelites. And the way the the book is framed is in the center, chapters 3 through 16, you have the story of judges. Um, Judges are not sitting um, in a courtroom being a gavel. Like they're all these military leaders who are bringing about some form of justice empowered by God to do so, even though they're wicked and corrupt people. Um, But there's 12 judges in this book and there's six major judges, like six uh, focused stories that we we read through. Um, But some of them like only get one or two verses like, um, man, what's the one who only gets one? Um, Yeah, Shad, uh, Shagar, (laughs) he he only gets one verse and it's very short. He just says that he, he judged, I think it's in chapter three, the end of chapter three. Um, but these, these, these middle sections, they're focusing on judges and there's this cycle that's introduced in chapter two through the beginning of, of chapter three. And the basic pattern that we're introduced to is that Israel sins and in their sin, God hands them over to a, a foreign power to oppress them. Maybe the Philistines or the Moabites or the Canaanites or the Midianites, someone comes and they oppress they oppress the Israelites for a certain amount of time. Sometimes it's eight years, sometimes it's two years, sometimes it's 20 years. It, sometimes it spans a very long time. And then finally, the people of Israel repent. And the way it happens is just like in the book of Exodus. The people cry out to the Lord. They cry out to the Lord. And then what God does is he raises up a deliverer, um, one of these judges to deliver or to save the people from the oppression that they're under. The judge does something crazy. There's a battle that happens and then there's peace in the land. And there's usually a little time marker for how long there's peace. Sometimes 20 years, sometimes 40 years, sometimes it's 80 years. There's peace. And then eventually the cycle continues. So that cycle happens six times with all like these words happening in it. But we're, we're told that every judge, this is the cycle that's taking place. The way the book begins in chapter one is you have a recounting of the conquest. Basically the book of Joshua is, is summarized in a single chapter. And the first half they're like, the conquest has gone great. We have conquered the land. Uh, Joshua has led us um, and uh, and Joshua dies. But then the second half of the chapter is like, well, here's all the places that we didn't conquer and all the places left to be conquered. And it's list after list of, of towns and regions that the people failed to drive out and then they lived with the people there. So that's like a big no-no. So the intro to the book of Judges gives you this mixed sign of, ah, oh, well, it seemed like things were going good in the last book. But now this makes me wonder if things are actually going good. So then you read the rest of the book and you're like, things are not going good. <laughs> things are going very, very bad. On the other side, Verses 17 through 21, it's two stories of tragedy. They have nothing to do with judges. There's no judge mentioned in these two stories at the end. Um, They have a lot of parallels between them, and we'll actually look at at them today. But the first story is about the religious corruption of Israel, and it's all about this this false sanctuary and um, temple worship system being established in the city of Dan. It's very sad how that unfolds. The other story is about the civil and the moral corruption of the people of Israel. And it has this whole story about this man's wife slash concubine, and then a civil war breaking out and the people just over and over again doing what is right in their own eyes. That's big picture, big picture stuff. I What I want to do today is talk a little bit about this section, I want to do the Gideon story and I want to do this section. I've learned that I often plan too much. So I'm planning a few things to talk about. Um, and as we go, speak up, ask questions. Let's talk about it. Cause there's only a few of us right now and it could be fun. The entire book of judges. If you're wondering what is this trying to say to me, 
It's in that repeated line at the very end. So Joshua 20, or Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So if the book of Judges functioned as a help wanted sign, what is it saying we need? We need a king. We need a king to save us. Because without a king, everyone does what's right in their own eyes. So the book of Judges stands as like this huge plea. We need a king. And then either if you're reading the Hebrew ordering or our ordering of the Bible, the next book in the Hebrew ordering is 1 and 2 Samuel, which is about the rise of King David. Or it's the book of Ruth, which is about the ancestors of King David. So the entire book of Judges sets you up for these following books, which is about the king coming. Yes. I have a question. Also, reading a little bit. Not like mm-hmm. there was that one point where, like, the people following Jesus were like, mm-hmm. and he was like, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. like, that was like, mm-hmm. so how does that tie in? Because it's like, yeah. Yep. In, in John, I think that's John 6 that you're referencing. Um, it's there, they don't want, uh, a king that Jesus is going to be. They want to make him like a Saul type of king to make him a conqueror who's going to fight with a sword and and win victories and then just give them things. So it's not that their desire for a king is wrong. It's the type of king they want is what's wrong. Yep, good question. Okay, so first let's go to Judges chapter two. Just found out Joshua died. And then the beginning... Um, this is interesting. Now, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, who's speaking? Angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? It's starting to blur the lines between the angel of the Lord and the Lord. We, who, uh, the people of Israel. The, I know, but it's, it's like he's talking to the people of Israel. Uh, I, yeah, so the angel of the Lord is always a visible figure in the Old Testament, someone who they see. And um, Judges 1 and 2 overlap in time with the end of the book of Joshua. So at this point, Joshua is still alive. They're having that gathering that happened in um, Joshua 21 through 24, where Joshua calls the people together And then he's calling them to covenant faithfulness. So this is taking place during that. That God is appearing and he's speaking to them. And it's the angel of the Lord who's appearing. And the angel of the Lord who's saying, I made a covenant with you. It's as if he is saying that he is Yahweh. So there is distinction between the angel of the Lord and the Lord. But there's also unity between them. Helping, this is slowly forming the categories for New Testament Christology, when we talk about who Christ is as being both God and different from God, distinct from God. Or as John says in John chapter one, uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. Unity yet distinction. So this is just forming those categories for us. So it's not uh, unfamiliar to us. So then Joshua dies and then you get Um, From verse 11 through chapter 3, verse 6, you basically have like the prelude to the book of Judges. Um, If you ever go to a musical, there is a song at the beginning. It's called an overture. And usually it has little pieces of all the songs that you're going to hear in the musical uh, all mixed together to one to almost set up the entire story and all the themes that you're going to hear. So that's what an overture is. Um, this is the overture to the book of Judges. Is all the themes are logged into this little section. So every time it's going to start with uh, this line usually. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight or in the eyes of the Lord 
and served the Baals, served the lords, um, either other nations or uh, other foreign gods. They abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they went after other gods. Um, because of this, God allows oppression to happen, foreign occupation. Verse 16, then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. So in their distress, they cry out to God. God raises up a judge. Uh, after the judge is raised up and saves them, uh, then there's peace and then the cycle continues. But you have these notes towards the end that these nations were left in the land to test Israel. And these are the nations the Lord left to test Israel. They were for the testing of Israel. So the reason why God allows these foreign nations to occupy and even oppress Israel at times is to test Israel. So a test. This doesn't mean like if I give you a pop quiz where I say this is pass or fail. There's going to be a hundred questions, multiple choice. Good luck. That's like you're hoping for the best. A test, um, when we read it in scripture, is more like um, a testing of metal where you put it in a pot and you um, heat it up. And what happens is the metal gets refined and the impure metals, they float to the top. It's called dross. And then you scoop the dross out. And what you're left with is the pure metal. Um, testing, this word testing, is revealing what's already there. I have a motorcycle and I've used this illustration in high school. Ben, you might remember it. Um, but I have a motorcycle and before you ride a motorcycle, you're supposed to do a pre-ride check. So you're supposed to check the oil level. You know, you check your gas, you, you see the mileage. You also check your tire pressure. Um, all of this, it's not mustering up something that's not yet there. It's just revealing what is there. So either my bike passes or fails the test, but what it does is it exposes what's already there. So God testing the Israelites, he's not trying to find out for himself. He's just revealing to them what is already there. He is making um, what is true become evident. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying that, like, thinking about how, like, the fake metals look like and Mm -hmm. So would you say okay, us, I would say that. Yep. And I think James would also say that at the beginning of his letter to the church, he also says that testing refines you. And that's why you should be joyous and celebrate when God gives you tests because he is purifying you. Yeah. Okay. Then the judges cycle will begin. We have Othniel, we have Ehud. And Ehud is from the clan of Benjamin, and he's a left-handed man. It is interesting, huh? What's in, what do you find interesting about it? Mm hmm Because you draw across your body. Mm-hmm. That's great. So just keep in mind that he's from the tribe of Benjamin and he's left-handed. Okay, just like log that into your storage bank because it will come up later. Um, there's also with each person, there's usually mentions of their hands and also the spirit of the Lord coming upon them. So look, look with at Othniel real quick up here. So in verse nine, the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. The Lord raised up a deliverer for the people. Verse 10, the spirit of the Lord was upon him. The spirit of the Lord clothes these people and empowers them to deliver the people. That phrase, the spirit of the Lord was upon him. That's going to just be like blinking red lights and flashing in the book of Isaiah. And it's going to be really important. But it's always this little line about God interceding and acting through a human agent to bring about salvation for the people. Uh, and then the um, judge usually prevails and there's a line, something like, and his hand prevailed. So the land had 
rest. And all these words are words that we've heard before or words that we're going to hear in later books. So there's a lot of, of interweaving going on here. Uh, right hand can be used as a metaphor for power. So sitting at the right hand, it's the seat of power and authority. Um, but usually they're also just mentioning the hands that they do these things with. So um, the line, and his hand prevailed, his power and strength prevailed. Uh, that we might be reading other cultures into okay. to that. But then you have Ehud, and the mention is of the left hand. So you have a story about a right hand. You have a story about a left hand, and God bringing deliverance through um, a hand. Then you have Shamgar, and he gets one verse. Shamgar, I mentioned this in an email, he is probably not an Israelite. He's probably actually um, a Canaanite of, of some sort. So over time, this book slowly changes how you see both Israel and the judges to where you can't tell the difference between them and a Canaanite, which was the whole point of the conquest of driving them out was so that you don't become like the people. And yet judges says they became just like the people. And it's very sad. Okay. We're going to talk about Gideon. So the cycle continues for chapter six, verse one. The people of Israel did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. So Midian comes in and they oppress the people. Verse five, for they came up with their livestock and their tent. They would come like locusts in number. They're going to be compared to locusts twice in this story. I'm just trying to highlight it now because there's going to be a prophetic book later. The book of Joel. Um, that's going to talk about the day of the Lord as a day when the locusts swarm over the nations. Um, locust is a metaphor in this story for people and livestock and basically a, a foreign army is what's being metaphored to here. So Joel just expects you to know stories like this and get the references. The people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel. He said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave them their, and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord, your God. You shall not fear the gods, of the Amorites in whose lands you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So this sounds really similar to what we read in, in chapter two of the angel of the Lord saying, with the exception of the prophet introduces his saying as thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. The angel, the angel of the Lord doesn't say that. The angel of the Lord just starts speaking. He says, I brought you out of Egypt. I made a covenant with you. So uh, if it were, if there was more distinction, perhaps the angel will have said, thus says the Lord and would have clarified that he's a messenger, but you don't have that. Okay, so then you have Gideon. This story is awesome for the topic of angelology, which is the study of angels or the study of spiritual beings. It's also uh, a great little section for what's called Christology, which is the study of Christ, specifically the second person of the Trinity who became incarnate, took on flesh, and dwelt among us. It's also just a great chapter for this book. Okay. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth or the tree at Ophrah. So who is sitting underneath this tree? You just got told. Great. The angel of the Lord. He's sitting under this tree, which belonged to Joash, the Abizarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Okay, so who just appeared to Gideon and spoke to him? The angel of the Lord, all right? None of these are gonna be trick questions. I'm just asking you all to like see what we're reading and then repeat it. And Gideon said to him, please my Lord, lowercase l, please my Lord, if Yahweh is with us, 
why then was all this happening to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now Yahweh has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And Yahweh turned to him and said, all right, so who just turned to him? Who had appeared to Gideon before? Angel of the Lord. But now you find out. And Yahweh turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, the Lord said to him, Yahweh said to him, but I will be with you and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Where have we heard that before? But I will be with you. Joshua, Joshua. very beginning of Joshua. This is what God says to Joshua. He says, be strong, courageous, for I will be with you. But we also heard this um, to the objection of someone else. So here Gideon is saying, hey, my, my clan, my clan's so weak and I'm the least of my father's house. He's raising an objection for why he should be sent. Who else objected to being sent by God? Moses. And then what does God say to Moses in his objection? I will be with you. He doesn't even address the objection. He just says, I will be with you. So already your lights should be going off. Oh, Gideon, he's like this new Joshua. He's like this new Moses figure who's perhaps going to deliver the people. Maybe he's going to be the prophet like Moses that we're waiting for. Like all these things just start to like be like, it's all full of hope and expectation. And then it's going to be tragic disappointment with this story. But anyways, this is how, this is how the narrative is functioning. Verse 17. And he said to him, so this is Gideon speaking to Yahweh or the angel of the Lord. Um, he said to him, if now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. Where have we heard that before? If I found favor, uh, please just stay here. Let me go make a meal. Abraham. Yep. All the way back in Genesis 18, I believe it is. I think one of these has a foot. Nope. Nope. Mm, nope. Yes, Genesis 18, three through five. And said, oh Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree, under the tree, while a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourself and after you may pass on since you have come in your servants. So they said, do as you have said. And that whole story in Genesis 18 is Abraham having an encounter with Yahweh and two angels. All right, so Gideon is also like in this Abraham mold. It's like he's repeating an Abraham story too. Verse 19. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot. And he brought them to him under the terebinth, under the giant tree and presented them. And the angel of God, so who's going to speak to him? The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and unleavened cakes and fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. Okay, pause for a moment. Then Gideon perceived he was the angel of the Lord. So you, dear reader, you're introduced in verse 11 about to the angel of the Lord coming to Gideon. Does Gideon know it's the angel of the Lord? No. What does he think he, he's talking to? What do you think, Daniel? Probably like a surgeon. Yeah, just a man. Because angels look like humans. They do not have wings. They do not have halos. They look like humans. There are other creatures that are spiritual beings like seraphim and cherubim. They do have wings. But angels, they look like humans. 
So this entire time, Gideon, he just thinks he's talking to another guy who's like encouraging him and saying, hey, the Lord will be with you. The Lord's going to raise you up. And he's also strangely having a conversation with Yahweh during this time. And it's not until the angel does something miraculous where he touches the rock and it bursts up in flames and then the angel disappears. All of a sudden, Gideon's like, oh my gosh, that was the angel of the Lord. I was speaking to an angel. So it's not until something miraculous happens that they realize it's an angel. Yes, Dan, you have a question. It's a great question. And I think a lot of people have written on that. Yeah, great question. Did you have a question, Ariana? Oh, okay. Okay, now we're gonna hop back into it. So the angel of the Lord disappears. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, alas, O Lord Yahweh, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Do you remember any other people who made a comment about seeing someone face to face? Sally? Not Abraham. It's a story that you are really uh, invested in. Yeah. Yep. Um, Jacob, when he wrestles with God, uh, he names that place Penuel because he saw God face to face and lived. But now here, Gideon is sitting in that role too. Of We have echoes of Jacob. Now, remember Jacob? Was Jacob a good guy or a bad guy? Deceiver, right? He, he becomes blessed by God and yet he's deceptive. So now all of a sudden, your trigger should be going off about Gideon like, hmm, maybe he's not the guy we're expecting. Maybe he's Israel on his best days or maybe he's Jacob on his worst days. Because we have the trigger of Joshua, of Moses, of Abraham, but now of Jacob, who was a deceiver. Um, and the story of Gideon is going to go from really good to really bad. So it's kind of just like setting up the narrative as well. Verse 23, but Yahweh said to him, so angel of the Lord disappears and yet Yahweh still speaks to him. So it's as though there were two figures there and the angel wasn't just a mouthpiece for God to speak, but that Yahweh was also there speaking to and with Gideon. Yahweh said to him, peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. To this day, it stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abizarites. So he builds an altar at the end underneath a tree and he calls it, a name about the Lord. Just tons of hyperlinks to like all the stories that we've read thus far. Okay, so Gideon is sitting in these roles. Uh, what we were doing right there is we were focusing on how the angel of the Lord is, um, is both united with Yahweh, but distinct from Yahweh. And that in this story uh, also, angels are visible, and especially the angel of the Lord is a visible appearance looks like a human and it's not until something miraculous happens that the trigger goes off oh that was a spiritual being not just a person so Gideon is called to be the uh to be the the judge for Israel to deliver them from the Midianites um in verse 34 the spirit of the Lord clothes Gideon before they go into this battle and the way they win the battle is um f well, first God takes Gideon's huge army so Gideon wasn't too terrified of a man because he had an army of 22,000 people. He is a commander in his own regard. And I wouldn't say that that's a small tribe. You know, his, his whole thing was like, oh, my clan's like really small in, in, in Manasseh. He has 22,000 people ready to fight uh, with him and for him. But then what God does is he takes his army of 22,000 and he dwindles it down to 300 so that they can't say this was our doing but they can only give glory to God, which is not what happens in the story. Because when they go out to fight, Gideon's going to say, everyone shout for the Lord and for Gideon. And he makes like his army say that they're fighting for, for Gideon as well. But they go to battle and what they do is they basically just surround the city and what they, um, how they defeat their enemies is not with swords in their hands, but with a torch, clay pots, and trumpets. So the pots seem to have been, like they would have a torch and the pot, I think, was like this 
cylindrical cone around um, the torch, one to kind of shield light, but then also shield the wind as they walked. So that's why they can have three things in their hands, even though they don't have three hands. They surround the, the city that they're fighting against, and they all throw the pots down at the same time, and then all of a sudden the light becomes visible, and they start blowing the horns. So they're making all this commotion, and it feels like they're surround the enemy is surrounded by light, and the enemy, they start taking their swords out, and they kill themselves. In the chaos of all the noise and the light, they end up just killing themselves. So it's another passive victory, kind of like Jericho, of surrounding the nations, blowing blowing the trumpets, and then having victory without drawing a sword. Um, the, after the defeat of that city, then um, Gideon is now um, triumphant. He's victorious. And there, there's all this stuff that happens um, intertwined with the other nations where, where Gideon starts kind of like fighting with his own people and there's all this tension that's taking place. Um, but then at the very end, um, this is verse 18 of chapter eight. Then he said to Zeba and Zalmunna, where are my men whom you killed at Tabor? They answered, as you are, so were they. Every one of them resembled the son of a king. So Gideon's brothers all got killed. And then he, he's going to seek revenge for his brothers. And the way the people describe Gideon and, and his brothers, they say, well, they looked like you look. They all looked like kings. So Gideon looks like a king to people. He had, he had power and status. And when he won that victory, he said for Yahweh and for Gideon. And everyone shouted for Yahweh and for Gideon. Um, so, yeah, he even though he's raised up as a judge, he's... Um, he looks to other people like he's a king. Um, then after this victory, starting in verse 22 of chapter 8, then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, you and your sons and your grandsons, alas, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Good response or bad response? It's a great response. Everyone shows up and they're like, will you be our king? Will you reign over us? And he says, no, your king is Yahweh. It's like he's echoing the song in Exodus 15. When they go through the Red Sea and they sing about how the Lord reigns over his people. But then what happens? Verse 24. And Gideon said to them, let me just make like one small request of you. Um, Every one of you, give me the earrings from his spoil for they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, we will, willing you get, we will willingly give them. And they spread a cloak and every man threw in it the earrings of his spoil and the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. Besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the king of Midian and beside the collars that were around the necks of their camels and Gideon made an ephod. What's an ephod? Anyone remember? What it's is it? It's a thing worn by the priest. It's a thing worn by the priest. Yep. So a priest wears an ephod. And what Gideon does is he makes an ephod out of all this gold. One sec. And out of the purple cloth. And then he puts the ephod in the city in Ophrah. And all Israel hoard after it. I mean, they worship this golden ephod he makes. Uh, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more. And the land had rest for 40 years in the days of Gideon, the end story of Gideon. Yeah, you have a question. Let's head back. Yes, it does echo back to Exodus when Aaron does the same thing where he takes the earrings from Egypt and they make a golden calf. And here, Gideon says, I'm not going to be your king, but you know what? Make me really rich like a king. And I'm going to make uh, what a priest wears, but it's also going to be this idol that becomes worshipped and people are going to worship it. 
So Gideon, the one who delivers the people, is the one who ensnares the people back into sin. And remember, their big question is, will you come and rule over us? And he says, no, 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 I won't be your king, but I want to be rich like a king. Uh, the, well, the 40 years is rest. There's not foreign oppression during those 40 years. Yep. Okay, here's where it gets spicy. Jeru Baal, that's Gideon, another name for him. The son of Joash went and lived in his, his own house. Now Gideon had 70 sons and his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the, in the tomb of Joash, his father, at Ophrah. Okay, none of you get it, but it's so good. Let me open a new document and type really big for you. Maybe I can just do this manually. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> he names his son Abimelech, which means my father is king. Come on, everyone comes to Gideon, they say, be our king. And he says, no. But then he names his son, my father is king. Gideon chose to be king the entire time. And even though he had the pious answer, he was not a pious man at the end. He was corrupt and he was wicked and he ensnared the people back into sin. And he became the oppressor. And the story that you read after that about Abimelech, his son, is about how twisted and sadistic his son Abimelech is and how Abimelech oppresses his own people. So Gideon starts off great, ends really bad. The Gideon story is awesome. And we only looked at like two chunks of it. And there's a ton more things in there that we could have explored. But this is one of those things where... Um, you know, we can just read over these things and miss it. But now, you know, Abimelech means uh, my father is king. And that's what Gideon names his son. Right after you found out that Gideon said, I'm not going to be your king. But he was accepting it. So Abimelech ends up sucking and it's tragic. Um, okay. Questions on that? You guys are doing so good. You're so engaged and talkative this morning. I love it. Yeah, Ben. Um, if Gideon kind of sucks, why does like Gideon decide those guys who give him a <laughs> Why why are they named after? I have no idea. Uh, that's a great question to anyone watching at home. If you can research it, yeah, the Gideonites give out the. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Maybe they're not named after after him. Maybe it's just a coincidence. But yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, maybe they're, you know, they're trying to uh, reflect Gideon on his best days, not his worst. Just like Abraham had great days of faith and he had really bad days of faith too. Okay. Uh, that's the only judge we're going to talk about unless we have time at the end. I want to talk about the stories at the end of the book because um, they're the most disturbing and I think hard to wrestle with, but also the most impactful for how this whole story communicates. So... Um, it's 9.53, so we will just briefly go over the Micah and Danite story, um, but not looking at it in detail. So starting in 17, all of a sudden, this is like the appendice to the book where there's no more mention of judges. It's just about what's happening in Israel. And there's not really mention of, of foreign oppressors anymore either. And there's not mentions of the spirit of the Lord coming on people and, and of deliverers delivering uh, the Israelites. What you have is these two stories that are depicting Israel's um, universal corruption. One is about their, their temple worship system, and the other one is about their civil and moral corruption. Both very tragic and very sad, and both saying we need a king to lead us. So Judges 17 and 18 is this story about Micah, and that's his shorthand name. The first few times his name appears 
Um, let's see. Uh, his name is, um, yeah, is Mika Yahu, who is like the Lord. Who is like the Lord? That's his name. You're introduced to this man who's named who is like the Lord, but he robs his own mother of, of gold and silver, but then he gives it back to her. Uh, but his shorthand name is just Micah. He robs his mother, um, but then he gives it back to her. And what she does is she, you know, she's thankful. So she actually gives him some money back. It's, it's to the Lord, but it's to Micah. And he takes it and he makes a carved and metal image. He makes a little idol statue, just like Gideon was doing. And he also makes an ephod. And then he makes some household gods and he takes his son and he ordained his son or he put power in his hand, put power in his hand over the house. And he basically makes his son this little priest uh, of his own household gods and statues. And then it's the first time you hear this line that repeats four times in the end of the book. In those days... There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The story continues with a Levite who's from Bethlehem in Judah, sojourning through the hill country of Ephraim. And he comes to the house of Micah. And Micah gets this bright idea. He's like, ooh, a Levite. So he invites the Levite to be um, the, the priest in his household. So it kind of replaces his son. And, and this um, sojourning Levite says, sounds good to me. So he becomes a priest in this little household of Micah. Then the Danites um, start wandering through because they're going um, to spy out land in the northern part of Israel to um, have a conquest, a pillage, and to take some of the land over. And they come to this household and they actually go to this, uh, this rebellious Levite and they say, hey, will you like speak over us, prophesy, tell us what's going to happen. And he says, you guys are going to have good success on this mission. So they go up, they spy it out, they come back. Then all the Danites, they're going on their mission. And as they're passing through this town, those spies are like, hey, there's this house that has gods there and a priest. So they go into that house and they steal all of the household gods and they take the Levite with him and they're running away. And the Levite's like, well, hold on, I'm, I'm with Micah. And they all tell him, would you rather be the priest of a household or the priest of an entire clan? And he's like, that sounds pretty good to me. So he takes the promotion and he goes with them. They all go up to this city called Laish and they um, lay plunder on it. In verse 29 of chapter 18, it says, And they named the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their ancestor, who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was Laish at first. You guys recognize that line? Sounds very similar. Where do you recognize it from, Ariana? I mean, I know it was last week when we talked about Mm-hmm. It was last week when we talked about this. So back in the book of of Joshua, 18 maybe, for the allotment to Dan. The seventh lot came out for the tribe of the people of Dan, according to their clans. And the territories of its inheritance included, I'm not going to read all the names, verse uh, 47. When the territory of the people of Dan was lost to them, So they were given this land. Then they lost the land. The people of Dan went up and fought against Leshem. And after capturing it and striking it with the sword, they took possession of it and settled in it, calling Leshem Dan after the name of Dan, their ancestors. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the people of Dan, according to their clans. So we've heard this sentence before, but just with a slightly different name. Leshem also had another name called Laish, same city, same place. So in this story, in Judges 18, this story is taking place when the people of Dan, after the people of Dan lost their tribal inheritance, and now they're going up to Dan, which is not in the tribe of Dan. It's in the tribe of Naphtali, and they capture this city. And what the people, then verse 30, and the people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves and Jonathan. Now we get the name of that, that 
sojourning Levite, Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of captivity of the land. So they set up Micah's carved image that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. So you have this little end statement that this little rebellious temple system that's established in Dan, which is at the northern part of the city of the um, country of Israel, they have this going all the way until the time of exile. Uh, and even the carved image made, the, that's there until after the tabernacle moves from Shiloh, uh, which, which we're going to read about in 1 Samuel. It moves locations. And with the establishment of the United Kingdom under David, they get rid of this false worship center, kind of. But it still goes even until exile. So from the time of Judges all the way until at least 722 BC, which is when Assyrian exile takes place, there is this center of false worship taking place in the city of Dan. Heartbreaking. So this is one reason why exile is justified by God. Yes, absolutely. Verse 6, and the priest said to them, go in peace. The journey on which you go is under the eye of the Lord. Oh yeah. So this is the, that, that's this Jonathan, that sojourning Levite. Uh, he's just like, he's just like saying, Hey, you're going to have success. It doesn't mean that he's a true. Yeah. He's just doing, doing the business. Yeah. Yep. And all the way back in Joshua, these tribes were already guaranteed success if they, Go in the conquest. That's why God says, be strong and courageous. Because I will be with you and you will have success and you will drive out the people from where your feet treads. Like they've already been guaranteed success. They don't need someone else to tell them. So the story of Micah and the Danites um, takes place early on and it has implications all the way until exile. Then we have another story. Uh, It just changes starting in verse one. In those days, When there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite sojourning in a remote part of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah, and his concubine was unfaithful to him, and she went away from him to her father's house in Bethlehem of Judah, and was there some four months. So another story about a Levite sojourning uh, in the hill country of Ephraim, which we're going to... Uh, which we just read, but also has association with Bethlehem in Judah. So similar to the last story, but it's going to be different. So he, uh, it doesn't seem like the wife was unfaithful in marriage, but rather um, like displeased with her husband. So she goes back to her father's house. Then he comes and he speaks kindly to her to bring her back home. So, they're from, he lives in Ephraim, which I think I have a map. Okay. Oh, no. This is how I find information. I just type in Israel tribe map. I think it's helpful. So uh, here's Naphtali. There's Dan, that city that they captured, even though the, the tribal land of Dan is down here. That city of Dan is up there. Um, Bethlehem is in Judah. They're going to go to Jerusalem and they're going up into the hill country of Ephraim, which is right here. This little strip where Benjamin and Ephraim border each other. That's the hill country. So they're from Ephraim. They have marital disputes for four months. She goes home to Bethlehem and Judah. He goes down to get her. And then they're going to go back to Ephraim. And this story takes place during their journey. As they're journeying, they depart, and it's starting to get later in the day, and they get close to, to Yebus, Jebus, which is Jerusalem. And it's called Jebus because it's uh, inhabited by the Jebusites. Jerusalem hadn't been conquered at the time of this story yet. And they're going, and he's like, you know what? We're not going to stay somewhere where there's foreigners. We should stay somewhere that there's Israelites. So we'll keep going on to Gibeah, and we'll either stay at Gibeah or Ramah. And as they're going, they go 
uh, and they make it to Gibeah. And we're going to pick up the story here in verse 16, and we're going to read it. And behold, an old man was coming from his work in the field at evening. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was sojourning in Gibeah. The men of the place were Benjaminites. The men of the place were Benjaminites. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going? And where do you come from? And he said to him, we are passing from Bethlehem in Judah to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, for which I come. I went to Bethlehem in Judah, and I am going to the house of the Lord. But no one has taken me into his house. We have straw and feed for our young donkeys, with bread and wine for me and your female servant and your young man with your servants. There is no lack of anything. The old man said, peace be to you. I will care for all your wants. Only do not spend the night in the square. So he brought him into his house and gave the donkey feed, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. As they were making their hearts merry, a phrase for drinking together, so sitting down, they're drinking. As they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows, or the sons of worthlessness, or maybe the sons of Belial, which is a... Um, a uh, Babylonian goddess of death. Um, so these worthless fellows surrounded the house, beating on the door. And they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. Sound familiar? Yep. With Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19 verse four and five. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last house surrounded the house and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Sodom and Gomorrah, it's two men and they want to know them. In the story at Gibeah, it's one man and they want to know him. Verse 23, and the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said, No, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing, which is an echo of Genesis 19, verse 7. And they said, and, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Verse 24, Behold, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now. Violate them and do with them what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do this outrageous thing, which is just like Genesis 19, verse 8. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. So it's a replay of the Sodom and Gomorrah story where the tribe of Benjamin, these Benjaminites are just as wicked and corrupt as the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's all hyperlinked using all the same language and phrases from that story and that story linked together. But the men would not listen to them. They're like, no, we don't want, we don't want those people you're offering. We want that man who came into your city. So the man sees his concubine and made her go out to them. Uh, that, that him is the Levite, um, the, the husband of the concubine. He takes his concubine, his wife, throws her out. And then the night unfolds where they sexually abuse her uh, until morning, and she dies. She dies from the trauma. He opens the door the next morning. She's laying at the door. He says, hey, get up. All right, let's go home now. Now that I'm safe and they're gone, let's go home. And she doesn't move. He realizes that she's died. So then he loads her on to his donkey. He goes to his house and he cuts up her body into 12 pieces and he sends the pieces to all the tribes of Israel. So then they all converge, starting in verse 20. They all come, they gather together. Then all the people of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba, just for the sake of it, this map. Dan is up here. And then uh, Beersheba, it's not on this map, but Beersheba is like down here. 
So anytime you see the phrase from Dan to Beersheba, it's talking about one of the northernmost cities and the southernmost cities. So it's a way of saying all Israel came out. So it's just a way of encompassing all of Israel. In other words, then all the people of Israel came out from the whole land, including the land of Gilead, which is on the other side of the Jordan, um, the land of Gideon and of Gilead and the congregation assembled as one man to the Lord at Mitzpah. And the chiefs of all the people of all the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, 4, 400,000 men on foot that drew the sword. Now the people of Benjamin heard that the people of Israel had gone to Mitzpah. In other words, they didn't go to Mitzpah. And the people of Israel said, tell us how did this evil happen? And the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, I came to Gibeah that belongs to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to spend the night. And the leaders of Gibeah rose against me and surrounded the house and against me by night. They meant to kill me and they violated my concubine. She is dead. What details does he leave out? That he threw her out. Yeah. Yeah, Danny. Uh, they weren't gathering around to kill him. It says that they were gathering around to know him, which is a Hebrew euphemism for sexual relationships. So um, one of the ways that um, people in this time would show their dominance over other men is they would rape them. So that's what's happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's where the term sodomite comes from. Um, they're gathering around because they want to um, gang rape this man to show their dominance on him. That's what's happening in this story, too. So they didn't want to kill him. They wanted to do something um, equally bad or worse. What a great note to take communion on. <laughs> uh, no, we're not. But okay. Yeah. Yeah, Ariana. Um, a concubine is um, not a, a wife. It's like a second category wife. So throughout the story, um, they refer to the Levite as the husband of this man, but he refers to her as a concubine. So it's kind of like a, a slave wife or a second class wife. So there's still um, a, bound, a binding, but usually the person would have a wife and then also a concubine. So Abraham had his wife, his two wives, Leah and Rachel, but then also had two concubines that were their slaves. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the way that this Levite discusses, um, he tells the entire congregation that what's going to take, that the reason all this took place is because they forced themselves and took his concubine. It's basically how he's making it sound. And what happens is then um, a civil war breaks out because the people hear about this evil and they're like, we will not let this stand. So all the tribes with their, their 400,000 men, they assemble to fight against the Benjaminites for what they have done. Throughout the story, if you notice, they battle, people die on both sides, and then they go to the Lord and they say, should we keep fighting? And God does keep telling them to fight. So even though the Levite, he's like inciting this, this civil war by not being totally honest about how it happened, that doesn't negate the fact that what the Benjaminites did was very evil and wicked in God's eyes, and God is bringing judgment on them. So, um, the people of Israel arose and went to Bethel and inquired of God, who shall go up first for us to fight against the people of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up first. You guys recognize that line? Ben, you're shaking your head, yeah? Not the line, but it was like the Lord's line. Yeah. Uh, the Levites go, I don't know. The Levites step into the water first. The people who fight first. Yeah. So back in Judges 1. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord answered, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. So Judah is the one who goes in first and fights. And because of that uh, and the promise from Genesis 49, uh, it is the tribe of Judah that the king, 
King David and then eventually King Jesus comes from and is the one who is the head of even the tribes that leads about this conquest of salvation. But uh, Judges 1, 1 and 2, it's Judah who's going to lead the fight against the Canaanites. Now, in the, ben- the last word. Yeah, they've been they've been doing things on their own up to this point. And they, yep, yep, yeah. So now in verse eighteen, you have like that repeated phrase, but it's not the Canaanites that Judah's going to go and fight against. It's the Benjaminites. So what does that compare the Benjaminites to? The Canaanites. Yeah. So you're getting like this parallel. Wow, the Benjaminites are acting like the Canaanites, and now the conquest is coming upon even the people of Israel because they have become like Canaan. That's the whole um, point of the book of Judges is that the people have become like Canaan and they need a king. So the people rise and they continue to fight. Uh, And then in verse 26, then all the people of Israel, the whole army went up and came to Bethel and wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, ministered before it in those days. Notice that's just like a little bracket. Trying to give you a little bit of a detail that's happening here. The fight continues, uh, and, and here's how the story unfolds. So they finally continue to fight against the Benjaminites. They win. They destroy the city of Gibeah. They drive out the Benjaminites. They, they kill a lot of them until there's only 600 Benjaminites. And they run. They flee to the Rock of Ramoth, which is, is over in the east in the desert area. Then they feel bad about all this because they're like, well, one of our brothers, the tribe of Benjamin, they're going to basically go extinct. So what they do is they say, you know what? what, what clan among us didn't come to the assembly when we were discussing all this? And they realize that there's a clan from Eastern Manasseh that didn't come. So they say, you know what? We'll go destroy that clan because they weren't on our side. And we will take all the women who have not known a man yet. And we will give them to the Benjaminites. And there's only 400, even though there were 600 men. So then they devise this plan about, well, since they still, we still need 200, how about we steal some women from another city during a festival? And the reason all this is happening is because they had made these O's in their first gathering about whoever, whatever tribe has not gathered, we will fight against. That ends up being the Benjaminites. Then they also made this oath, whatever tribe did not come up, we will not give our, our daughters to them in marriage. So this is their way around their oaths that they have made. they had made these oaths and now they're having to like backdoor step it so that they don't break their oath, but that, so they can also give people to the Benjaminites so that they don't... Um, they don't go extinct. Uh, the, the story um, just kind of ends on a really low note. And then you find out in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So this is setting up both the book of Ruth and the book of First and Second Samuel, where God's going to raise up a king to be a deliverer for the people. The story of, um, of Judges goes from okay to bad to really bad, to worse. So the way this book is outlined is it wants you to see this crescendo of the evil of Israel crying out, saying, we need a king to solve this problem. Not a king like we want, not a king like Gideon, eventually not a king like Saul, but we need a king that God gives us um, to guide us into what is right. And we need a better Moses. We need a better Joshua. But here is the interesting thing. So this is now just going to fit together how your Bible is operating. I hear my baby crying. So you had that little phrase in uh, chapter 20, verse 27, 28. For the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, ministered before it in those days. You guys remember Phinehas? Well, we can do some simple math. We can work backwards. You guys remember Aaron, brother of Moses. Aaron's son, 
Eleazar is the next high priest after him while they're in the wilderness after Aaron dies. And his son, Phineas, we heard about all the way back in the book of Numbers. Phineas is the one who is zealous and he, he spears through the Israelite and the, the Midianite woman, woman who was leading the rebellion against God in the wilderness. So Phineas has been around since the book of, of Numbers. Phineas did not live a super long time, according to what we know. And the book of Judges, as we've been going through, you hear about how long the Israelites are oppressed. Then you hear about how long there is peace in the land. And if we did the math, there's probably overlap in some spots, but it comes out to being anywhere between 300 and 500 years. Phineas was not living 500 years. He was much shorter than that. What this is helping us realize is that actually this story that we see at the end of the book of Judges, in its chronological order, this story as well as this story actually take place over here when they first entered the land before or maybe during the first few Judges. Because the book of Judges, as well as other books, sometimes um, as far as priority, chronology is not first priority. Instead, theme is first priority. So right here, this is one of those examples to that where the book of Judges ultimately isn't just trying to give you a timeline, but it's trying to show you Israel descending into chaos to become like Canaanites. These stories take place in here, but the entire, entire book functions to say Israel has rejected God. They have become like the Canaanites. Therefore, they need a king and the kings are going to be like this as well. So I think that's just a cool detail about how these stories fit together. So scholars will take all these stories and then try to put them into chronological order. I think that's a good exercise. But the point of Judges is that Israel has descended and become like the Canaanites. Any questions on those two stories? A lot. I did not. Thank you. Okay. We mentioned uh, Ehud, who's a left-handed man. He, he spears uh, the big fat man and the sword goes in. Um, in this story uh, about these, uh, these Benjaminites, you, let's see, where is uh, it? This is, this is chapter 20, and I am looking at... Um, starting in verse 14. Then the people of Benjamin came out together out of the cities to Gibeah to go out to battle against the people of Israel. And the people of Benjamin mustered out of their cities on that day, 26,000 men who drew the sword besides the inhabitants of Gibeah, who mustered up 700 chosen men. Among all these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed. Every one could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. You remember what tribe... Ehud was from Benjamin, and he was left-handed. So of those warriors from uh, Gibeah, it's almost as if we can, knowing that this story likely comes before these ones, I think there's even a redemptive principle here where God is even redeeming these, these Benjaminites through Ehud, through raising him up to be a deliverer. That God, through his grace, he raises up deliverers from unlikely sources uh, and, and people who are undeserving. And I think this whole book is about the grace of God, where God rescues people who do not deserve it and do not appreciate it. Um, but there is another link between these stories as well. So Othniel, he uh, is given victory. He prevails by his hand. Then Ehud, with his left hand, he has victory. Deborah, there's a mention of, of, of her hand. Um, there's not mentions here. But then Samson, there are mentions of his hand again. On, he puts both his hands on, a pill, on the pillars and he pushes it down. And he brings victory over the Philistines through his own death. Through his outstretched arms and hands, he brings victory through his own death. Come on, guys. Yeah. So, so all this is just slowly forming a picture uh, of eventually a better judge a better savior, a better Moses, who is not as corrupt as the people, but who is righteous. And he will die for the wicked and, and give over his righteousness to those who do not deserve it in an act of grace and salvation by God.